record. Okay. So for number one, let me write it down. It just says to find the limit. So bear with me, I'm just gonna copy it down real quick. And then it says, if you if the limit does not exist, type DNE. If it does, you could type the word in, in infinity if you get infinity, or you can type a negative and then the word. So let's go see what we get. So if I were to try to plug in zero directly, it would cause a problem, right? Why would it be a problem if I try to plug in zero? Mm -hmm. There's X on the bottom, right? So if I try to plug in zero down there, the whole thing is going to be undefined, right? So we have to probably algebraically manipulate this a little bit so that that X at the bottom will go away, okay? Does any, I know it's way, way back, so I'm going to ask first because somebody may remember. <laughs> Does anybody remember the strategy on how to start? Not divide by x. Uh huh. You need to take the conjugate of, well, the only guy that has two terms is the numerator, right? So we're going to multiply by the conjugate. Because this is already divided by x. So the conjugate would be plus one. I think I know what you're trying to get at, and we'll try that in a minute. I think I know exactly what you're referring to. You're referring to when x goes to infinity, we normally divide by the largest power of the denominator, right? But that's usually when x goes to infinity, okay? Okay, so if I were to do this, let's see what we have. So it would be this times this, which means I have the house times itself, which means it's squared. Then I have this times one, which is a positive house. Negative one times the house gives me a negative house. And then negative one times positive one is negative one. Now at the bottom, don't actually multiply it out because remember the goal is to get rid of that X because it was causing an issue. Okay. So you wanna leave it alone and hopefully cancel it in some way. So here, I have some of it. Over here. I did not, but we'll use a blue highlighter to work. So you have a positive and a negative, right? Those will cancel. And then what happens when you have a house squared? Mm -hmm. So it's just one plus X and then this guy minus one. So what's going to happen with those ones? Mm -hmm. Oh, and if I imagine that they're not there, what else? Now that all I have on the top is x, can't the x in the top and the x at the bottom cancel now? Right? Because this guy's all by himself now. Now remember, there is a, neg a one in front of it, right? So this guy and this guy cancel. But you still have one on the top. And then the square root of one plus X plus one. I don't know why I put an equal sign there. Should probably be just a big giant parenthesis. Now I'm going to plug in zero. It's not too small, right? So let's see. We'll get one over square root of one plus zero plus one, which is just the square root of one, which is just one. So we get one half. Now, what does it want me to type in? It doesn't say, so I would literally just type in one half, or you could type in 0.5 or just 0.5 by itself, right? All three of those should be accepted. Oh, 
Okay, number two is this problem. Now be careful. I know you can't see it. It's gonna be hard to see, but that's an arrow and then a negative, okay? So there's an arrow, you can see the little hook of the arrow, but then right after the hook is a negative. I don't know why it's like smushed together, but it is. So it's actually X approaches negative three. And can I directly plug in negative three and get an answer? No, when I plug in negative three, it's gonna make it undefined, right? So we definitely have to manipulate this some way. Any suggestions? Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll factor, right? And cancel. So how do we factor the numerator? I know it'll be x and x, but then what multiplies they give us 18, but adds they give us nine? Six, mm -hmm. six and three. And then they would both have to be positive, right? This one tells you they're either both positive or both negative, because the only way I can multiply to get a positive is if both of them are positive, right? Or both of them are negative. And then that one's positive, which they both had to be positive. So these guys will cancel. This whole factor will cancel with this whole factor. And believe it or not, I still have people in Cal 2 trying to cancel terms instead of factors. So please stop. Don't do it. Do it in here and don't do it in the next class. <laughs> okay. I've only graded one class of my Cal 2 test, and I already had two people in that one class do it. And so of course me, I'm writing in all caps, never do this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> now can I plug in negative three? Yes. And so we actually end up with positive three as our limit. And it is an option, so I'm going to check it. Now, I don't remember if all of the final is multiple choice or if most of the final is multiple choice. Um, it seems like the review is like that. Like some of it's multiple choice, but then every now and then there'll be one where you have to like type in an answer. Okay. okay, let's look at number three. So this one is the limit as X approaches 14. And what does that plus sign mean? Yes. And it says find the limit algebraically or analytically. You may not use a graph to determine the limit, okay? Some people might be able to graph that. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to graph, but it's not the hardest thing to graph either. So on the test, I had a lot of folks graphing this one. Um, but then I was like, how do you know what the graph looks like if you don't have a fucking calculator, right? <laughs> so you have to like talk about how you know the graph. Um, but here, me personally, I would have done it analytically because I don't see anything that I could do algebraically that will get rid of the X minus 14 part, which is the problem, right? If I wanted to plug in positive 14, it's gonna give me zero in the denominator. So then just like number one, you would wanna get rid of that X minus 14 so that you could actually plug it in. But there's nothing I can do to make that go away, okay? If I multiply by its conjugate, I'm gonna get X squared minus, I don't know what, 196 or something like that. But when I plug in 14, it's still gonna go to zero, okay? So conjugates won't work here. So the best option is to do it what's called analytically. And all that means is a chart, okay? Use a chart. But because I'm using a chart, it's very specific which X values I should be plugging in. Okay. 
So if I'm trying to approach 14 from the right, think of your number line. Here's 14, on this side I have 15, and on this side I have 13, right? If I'm coming from the right, I'm coming in this direction. So what numbers would I be using? I'd be using 14.1, then 14.01, and so forth, right? And I'm getting closer and closer to 14 and figure out what's happening, okay? Be careful. I'm gonna give you an example. What if I asked you to find the limit as X approaches negative four from the right? What numbers would be going in the chart? Yes, because negative four is over here, right? And negative three is over here and negative five. I can't tell you how many people will put negative 4.1, negative 4.01, so on and so forth. But remember, you're going in this direction, trying to get as close as possible, right? So you're right. It is going to be negative 3.9, negative 3.99, and so forth. Okay? So be very, very, very careful that there's a negative. Positives are a little easier to think about. Negatives are a little bit trickier. OK, so I'm going to have to use my calculator here. Let's see, I'm going to do 14.1 store as x, and then I'm going to do fraction x, oops, that's a 5, x minus 3 over x minus 14. And so I get 111, 14.01, store it, and then plug it in. 14.001, stored and then plug it in. So what's happening here? What's happening to those Y values? Are they approaching a certain number or are they increasing or decreasing without bound? That's the math word that they use. It's going, it's increasing a lot, right? Just from one little decimal place, it went from like 100 to like 1,000 something, right? And then another decimal point, it went to like 11,000 something, okay? So this thing is increasing very fast, which is, you're right. It is going to go toward their positives, right? It's going to go toward infinity, but positive infinity. So our limit is infinity. And I think in the computer, we have to actually write the word infinity. Oh, no, let's just type it or select it. Number four is interesting. The department put it in here. It's very interesting. So let me write this down. F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Then it tells me F of X is 5X squared plus 3X minus 1, and then negative 2, 0. So it says, determine whether the mean value theorem can be applied to F on the closed interval A to B. In order for you to know whether or not it can be applied, your function has to be continuous on this interval. And this is a polynomial function, isn't it? Polynomials are continuous no matter what X is, right? They're continuous everywhere. So yes, it can be applied. That's not even an issue, okay? And it says, if the mean value theorem can be applied, then find all values of C such that you get this, okay? And notice that that C has to be in the interval. So if I do my math and I get two C values, I can only use the one that's in the interval, okay? It has to be a C value in the interval. And they literally give me the formula to figure all this out, okay? So I'm gonna go to my page. So this is A. And this is B. Notice I need the derivative, right? 
to find C. So what is F prime of X? Mm -hmm. 10x plus 3, good. So according to this, if I plug C into there, this would be 10C plus 3. And then I would have to do this thing. So I know that B is 0 and A is negative 2. But I also need to know what F of 0 is and F of negative 2. How do I figure those out? Mm-hmm. Plug them into F though, right? So that and that will actually just give me positive two down here. But what do I get when I plug in zero into this? Negative one. And what do I get when I plug in negative two into this? What'd you say? 13 positive? but there's still a minus there. So that's why I have the minus. Um, and then now, what is that going to be? That's going to be, what is negative one minus 13? Negative 14 divided by two, and negative seven, right? And then what happens here? I'm gonna add, add no, I'm gonna subtract three, aren't I? And then what is C? Mm -hmm. Is that number in this interval? It is. So this is the C value that they're asking you for. So we're literally just taking that formula that they got and just making sure we understand all the notation, right? We know when we have intervals, the first one is always the end and the second one. Right? And then we need to know that this by itself means these numbers get plugged into the original function and then that little cluster thing means I can get to the right? So it's just a matter of understanding the notation and then doing a tiny bit about this. It was just solving a linear equation, which is not too bad, right? So in here, it says, enter your answer or answers as decimals if the mean value theorem cannot be applied in A. Well, I didn't really get a decimal. I just got negative one. So I'm just going to type that. If you've typed point zero, it should still take it. Okay, let me write this function down and then I will read the direction. Also, when you're taking the exam, make sure you double check that you write down the right problems. This semester, I've had a couple of people throughout all the tests, just write down the wrong problems. Like they'll write the wrong sign somewhere, just double check it. So this one said to find the extreme, I believe. I'm gonna go look again real quick. Ah, and it tells me exactly how. It says I have to apply the first derivative test. I mean, are they gonna know? I'm only gonna look at your paper if you get it wrong, right? Um, so we'll do it if that's so. The first derivative test means I'm probably gonna need the first derivative, right? What is the first derivative? Mm -hmm. Plus 54, exactly. And how do you find out where the extrema would even be? Mm -hmm. Set it equal to zero. If it had a fraction, you would set both, right? The top and the bottom equal to zero. So we'll get negative 18x equal to negative 54, and then x equal to, I believe it's three, but let me double check. Yes. And the negative divided by a negative would be positive three. So 
So this is my critical number. And so then we set up our number line. Here's the critical number of three. And so I basically have two sides, right? I need to pick some test values. So over here, what test value do you want to pick? Okay. And what about over here? Four. Okay. Now those numbers get plugged into what? What is the test called? First derivative test, right? So we're going to plug those into the first derivative. Well, if I plug in zero there, aren't I just going to get 54? And f prime of four, negative 18 times four plus 54, I get negative 18. Does it really matter the number? Right, we just need signs, right? So this one's positive, this one's negative, which means this one's increasing, and then this one's decreasing. So what's happening to your graph if it's increasing until you get to three and then now all of a sudden it's decreasing? What's happening at three? Mm -hmm, the maximum. So it's going up, then down, which is giving you this maximum. So we have a max at x equal to three, but I think all the problems had points. They did. So, well, there's only two things and they have the same y value, don't they? So it's got to be that one by default. But if I wanted to know where that 83 came from, where did it come from? Mm -hmm. So if you want to know that y value, you have to find f of 3, which is this guy. So negative 9 times 3 squared plus 54 times 3 plus 2. And that actually is 83. Be very careful. I'm, I can't even tell you how many times I'm going to say be careful. But just be careful <laughs> when you take the test. Don't go too fast, OK? Because it'll be real easy to be like, oh, three, and then just click the wrong one here, right? But you have to make sure you click the one that says next. Okay. So number six asked us for the tangent line. Does anybody remember the equation for the tangent line? Say it again. X plus what? Yeah, yeah, I went to too many concerts. Uh-huh, yeah, there you go. We want it to look like that at the end, right? This guy here is very specific, right? Isn't it M10? And how do you find M10? Mm -hmm. So how do you find that? Is the first derivative of whatever the x value is. In my case, what is my x value? one. Okay. So if I want to find that m, that slope, I need to figure out what f prime of one is. Well, maybe not f prime. It looks like they have y prime, but it's okay. Same thing, right? Just write that. Now, how would I take the derivative of this, though? Mm -hmm. There are two ways. You could write that as 27 times parentheses x squared plus 2 close parentheses with a negative 1 exponent, but then it requires you to do chain rule. And not too many people remember to apply chain rule. So I suggest doing what you said, which is quotient rule. So we're going to do low d high. What's the derivative of 27? 0. Minus high 
D low. What's the derivative of the bottom? Mm -hmm. All over low squared. Well, this is literally going to disappear because it's times zero, right? So all you end up with is negative 54x over this guy. So if I want to find m10, I'm just going to plug in 1. What do we end up with? Negative 54 over what? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So we get negative 6. So we know that the m is negative 6. How do we figure out the whole equation? So right now, all I have is this. If I want to solve for b, I need to plug in y and x, because b has to be the only letter, right, in order for me to solve for it. But I do know what y and x are, don't I? Aren't they given to me? In the point, right? So my y is going to be 9, and my x is going to be 1. So then if I add 6, I get 15. B is 15. So put these two together, and you'll get your equation, OK? So my equation is going to be y equals negative 6x and a positive 15. Is that even one of the choices? Yes, it was. Yay. Oh, this was the one with that strategy we we're talking about. Let me write it down and then I'll back to my page. Remember, I will post it. So if we don't get the copy every bit down, leave some space, and then you can come back and just copy it from my, my document. OK. So for this problem, it just wants us to take the limit. But there were no other extra directions on it. OK? So there's two ways to do this limit. And I'm going to cover both because I'm not sure. I think on the final, I tell you which way to do it and I don't remember which way that is. So we're gonna do it both ways. You can pick which way, but don't get them mixed together, okay? There's a concept that is not taught in this class or in Cal 2 and I don't know why. It's kind of just glossed over and the Cal 2 people are like, you're supposed to cover it in Cal 1. And the Cal 1 people are like, no, that's supposed to be covered in Cal 2. So it never gets covered, <laughs> ever. It's called Lopitel's rule, OK? 
and it tells you to do it specifically that way. Good, good. Well, then I'll do this one the, the other way, and then I'll do the next one that way. The L'Hopital's rule is this. If you have the limit as x goes to infinity, positive or negative, it doesn't matter. And the way that the mathematicians express that is to put bars around x, okay? So x could be going to positive infinity or x could be going to negative infinity, okay? Um, if you have a top function and a bottom function, this is the same thing as finding this limit. It just happens to be the same limit, okay? That's L'Hopital's rule. It's such a small, simple concept. I don't know why both courses are like trying to pawn it off to the other. I don't get it, but it's very easy. And as long as what you have in the numerator and what you have in the denominator is pretty easy to take the derivative of, I would do it. And essentially what you do is you keep doing it until you get a constant, either in your numerator or in your denominator, okay? You just keep going. So Natalie says that number eight asks us to L'Hopital's rule. So we'll save that for number eight. For this one, we'll do it by other method, right? Which is the method, uh, Everardo, you were talking about, where we divide by what in this case? Which one, what will we divide by on this one? Yes, x squared. So whatever the highest exponent is, right, of the denominator. So in this case, we would have negative eight x over x squared, would have two over x squared, negative five x squared over x squared, and then four over x squared. So everyone individually, right? Now, if you can simplify it, do that before you take the limit. So here an x can cancel. So I just have negative eight over x. Here, nothing cancels. Here, the x squareds cancel, so I have negative five. And here, nothing cancels, so it's done. But then as x goes to infinity, what happens to every single one of those fractions? They all go to 0. So you end up with 0 plus 0 over negative 5 plus 0. And 0 over a number is OK. That's how I remember. So it's 0, right? This is OK. This is not OK. So that one will equal zero. This one is like that word undefined. <laughs> That's how I remember which one was. So we got zero. And it is on here. This one wants us to use L'Hopital's rule. Let me write it down real quick and then I'll go back to my paper. Now, I don't particularly like the way they write it, okay? Just FYI, you are taking the sign of this entire expression. But for me personally, I would have put it in parentheses. Okay? And when you do put it in parentheses, then it's more obvious that you would have to apply chain rule when you do the derivative, okay? So if I apply L'Hopital's rule, I should get the same bounds but I need to take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. The bottom's easy. What's the derivative of 3x? 3. The top's a little bit trickier only because of chain rule. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. But the angle doesn't change. However, it's not just x, which means I have to multiply by the derivative of it, which is 4. So you actually end up with, I like the 4 in the front right? And then three. And can you plug in zero directly? It's not going to cause a problem, right? It's not in the bottom. X is not in the denominator. So I'm going to get four cosine of four times zero, which is just zero. And what's the cosine of zero? One. So we end up with four thirds. It 
is there. It's kind of blurry because I have it like zoomed in crazy. Oh, your favorite. Weird problems, right? I don't know what happened with the programming, but it had the word slash. It's just supposed to be a slash, not the actual word. Um, but it's just centimeters squared per minute is what it's supposed to say. I'm wondering if whatever program that wrote this question had the wrong slash. And that's why it came out weird like that. And just it's gonna imagine all that red stuff is just a fraction bar. So this one says the radius r of a circle is decreasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute. How do I write that sentence down on my paper? If something is decreasing, the radius is decreasing, are we talking about the value of the original function? What do we do to figure out whether something is decreasing? We did it already on one of the problems. Yes, the derivative. So if it's telling you that it's decreasing, then it's talking about its derivative, okay? So it's not talking about r, it's talking about the derivative of r, okay? So if the radius is decreasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute, that means that the derivative is this five centimeters per minute. But specifically, is it positive or is it negative? Right, for decreasing, the derivative would have to be negative, right? So a lot of thought process in that one. And the weird part is, is how do you write the derivative of r? It's dr dt, right? You see all those centimeters per minute? Because the denominator is kind. So it's dr dt equals negative 5 centimeters per minute. Why is it negative? Mm -hmm. If it had said increasing, then drgt would be positive, right? Now let's see what else they have. So second sentence says, find the rate of change. This fancy word right here is just derivative. So find the rate of change of the area. So essentially what they want me to do is they want me to find out the derivative of area, which is written as the A. So this is my goal. Well, in order for me to find the derivative of the area, I first need to know what the area is, right? And then it tells me the last part, radius is six. So R equals six. What shape are we talking about here? Hmm? What's the area of a circle? What does that formula look like? So if I want to find the a dt, I just need to take the derivative of this equation. The derivative of a with respect to t is dA dt. The derivative of this side with respect to t, you're going to bring down your power and then decrease the power by 1. But then because you're doing the derivative with respect to t, you have to tag on a dr dt. So that's a one exponent, not a prime. Be careful. Let me make it look like a one. And I have all the numbers I need to plug in. You have R. What is R? Six. And I don't have to write power one. And then what's dr dt? Negative five. So when I multiply all that out, it's actually negative 60. Yeah, 
Okay. So if the radius is decreasing, it looks like the area is decreasing as well, right? Which makes sense logically, right? What happens there goes. So it would be this one. This is the only one with negative 60. And I'm gonna talk about the units real quick. This was radius was six centimeters, right? So this should have been six centimeters. So what happens when you take six centimeters times negative five centimeters per minute? Don't you get centimeters squared per minute, right? Stop times stop. No, no square. We brought down the and then decrease the power by one. We'll drop down the two and then take the There's only one power. And I didn't need to write this. I just didn't want it to look like an apostrophe, like our time. I made it look like one of those looking ones that they show you in kindergarten. Problem is, it kind of looks like a two, right? <laughs> Okay, halfway, we're halfway there. We are, what, an hour in? Almost. Oh, these are fun. Great. Number 10. From a thin piece of cardboard, 20 inches by 20 inches. So I'm literally going to draw a little. 20 inches by 20 inches means it's a square, isn't it? I'm going to try to draw a square. It does not look like a square, but whatever. 20 inches and 20 inches. And it says square corners are cut out. God, I'm going to need a bigger picture than that. So that the sides can be folded up to make a box. What dimensions will yield a box of maximum value? What is the maximum volume? This one's going to be interesting. Okay. So I drew it like this originally, but I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger because I want to be able to write in here. But they said they were going to cut out squares in each corner. The problem is, is I don't know how long the little squares are. Okay? But they are squares. So whatever this dimension is, it's the same dimension there, right? And it's the same for all four of them, correct? And if you were to like perforate this paper, that's what they're doing. Okay, so they're taking that sheet of paper, they're cutting out the little squares, and then when you fold those little flaps up, it creates like an open box, right? Um, the problem is, is we need to figure out what those dimensions look like so we can find volume. Because the volume of a... What is this, a rectangular prism when they fold it up? So it'll length, width, and height. Okay. Now I know that this whole thing is 20, right? And the same thing here. So if I want to know the length and width of the box, this right here, I'm going to do it in blue. This measurement right there would be the length, and this one right here would be the width. Aren't they the same though? Right? Because the paper, the cardboard itself is a square, and the little pieces are squares, right? So L and W should be the exact same thing, okay? L equals W. But what expression can I write instead of L and W using the 20 and the X? Just to figure out this measurement. Exactly, you got it. 20 minus 2x. Because it's the whole length, take out this section and take out that section, right? And aren't both of those little lengths an x? They're taking out two x's. Good, good, good. 
And then the height, remember you're folding these little flaps. So what would the height be? Exactly. Well, if you fold those little flaps, this is going to be your height. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug all of that in our formula. We have V equals 20 minus 2X, 20 minus 2X again. And then for H, it's just X. Now, depending on you, okay, some people would rather do quotient or product rule and chain rule and all this stuff. And then others will just multiply all that out until it's a polynomial and then take the derivative of the polynomial. Okay? For me, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, so I would foil out the two bubbles and then distribute the x later so that I can get v equal to a whole polynomial. And if I'm trying to find maximum, I have to take the derivative, right? So let's see what we get. 20 times 20 is 400. That's going to be negative 40, another negative 40. So negative 80x, positive 4x squared. And then I got to distribute that x. And so I end up with this for volume. And if I'm trying to find maximum, we have to have V prime. So what is the derivative of this volume? Does that look right? As a derivative. Okay, now I think, let me see. Do all of those divide by 12? No. Do they all divide by 6? No. Do they all divide by 4? Yes, they do. Just to make it a little bit simpler, and I'm going to rearrange it too. So I'm going to have 3x squared minus 40x and then plus 100. I do need to find my critical numbers. So I do need to set this equal to zero so I can find my critical numbers. But the nice thing is that I don't have to worry about that extra 4, right? Because we know that 4 cannot equal zero. So we're really just trying to figure out when this equals zero. There's two choices. You can factor it, or you can do what? Anybody remember? What kind of equation is this? It's a quadratic equation, and you can always solve any quadratic equation by using quadratic formula. So we're going to do x equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times b, all over 2 times a. I'm not going to do all the steps. I'm just going to type the whole thing in my calculator with a plus sign in front of the radical. And then I'll do it again with a minus sign in front of the radical. So that's going to actually turn into a positive 40 plus square root negative 40 squared minus 4 times 3 times 100. Another thing that I noticed that happens as a common mistake is when you're using your calculator, people will forget to type um, whatever you're squaring in parentheses. Now, if it's positive, it don't make a difference. But if what you're squaring is a negative and you do not put it in parentheses, it will give you the wrong answer. 
okay? So make sure that when you put it in there to square it, that it has the parentheses. Oh, that's nice. And I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to put a minus sign in front of the, the radical. Now, one of these is not plausible. Which one is it and why is it not plausible? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a box, right? <laughs> the whole length of the cardboard is 20 inches, but if this little dimension, which is X, right? If that little dimension is 10 inches, 10 inches, right? Yeah, 10 inches here and 10 inches there, doesn't it cut off the whole box, right? So you wouldn't even be able to have any perforated parts to fold up, okay, at all. So the 10 just doesn't make any sense. I can't cut out two 10 inch squares in the corners because I'll literally just cut my my cardboard into four pieces, essentially, okay? So this one is not plausible. So it's not that one. It has to be 10 over three. So then that means that the length and the width will be 20 minus two times this X value. And I don't know what that is. 20 minus two times 10 over three. It comes out to 40 over three, which is about 13.33. It just repeats. So notice that length and width, right, are 13.33. And then the height is going to be that uh, x value 10 over 3. So we need to look at those three measurements. What is 10 over 3? 3.333? OK, cool. So we need to find an answer that has those dimensions. Ah, oh, it's this one. So see the X value is different, right? Make sure you click the correct one. It says, what is the maximum volume? How would I get this number? What do you think we have to do? Exactly. So if you wanted to get the volume, you would just do 13, or actually it would be the fraction. 40 over three times 40 over three times 10 over which gives us times 10 over three. I'll give us an ugly fraction, but it's 592.6, which is exactly what they have. So that one was a little bit, I just had to like really think about it though. Don't go too fast. Okay, let me write this one and then I'll put the paper back so you can copy. Okay, number 11 is this one. And I believe it asked about 
concavity. So it says determine the open intervals on which the graph of this thing is concave down or concave up. So big idea, how do we figure out concavity? What do we mean? Second derivative, exactly. So first derivative would be negative 18x squared plus 16x plus six. And then the second derivative, that's better, would be 36x plus 16. And so if we want to find our critical numbers, we'll set that equal to 0. Sixteen divided by thirty-six is four over nine. So if I draw my number line, I only have one critical number, four over nine, which is actually like point four. Repeating. Because this helps you know like what numbers will be smaller or less. Or you could pick the obvious numbers, right? What's the obvious number that's less than this fraction? Is that guy less than that fraction? Mm -hmm. And what's another number that we know is bigger than this fraction? One. Is that big? So we're going to plug those into the second derivative to figure out concavity. Now, if I plug in zero, I'm just going to get 16. If I plug in one, I get negative 20. So this one's positive and this one's negative. This one means concave what? Up or down? Up. And then this one? Down. So what are the intervals for concave up? It's from what to what? Negative infinity to 4 ninths. And then concave down this side? 4 ninths to positive infinity. Now we just have to figure out the ones that match. So concave upward, no, that has a negative 4 ninths, so that's not mine. Um, negative infinity to 4 ninths, and then concave downward, 4 ninths to infinity. So ours is C, so we have to select. The video is recording everything too. So every time I have to toggle back and forth between Canvas and the paper, it's capturing both of them. Okay. Let me write this down real quick and then I'll go back to paper so you can finish writing. This one wants points of inflection. So what is a point of inflection? When what turns from positive to negative? The concavity. And not necessarily from positive to negative, but any change at all. Okay. So any change in your concavity, that's where the inflection points are. So if you're going concave down, and then all of a sudden you're going concave up, right? That little wiggle, that's the point of the inflection, okay? And vice versa, if I was going concave up and then all of a sudden I went down, again, that's a point of inflection. But if it has to do with the changing in concavity, then how many derivatives do I need? Mm -hmm, we need that second one, you got it. So first derivative here, one half times four x cubed, and then two times three x squared. So let me clean that up before I do the next derivative. Now we can do the second derivative. And that would be six x squared plus 12 x. Okay. 
And so how do I get my um, critical number? Mm -hmm. I said 6x squared and 12x equal to zero. Mm hmm Can you take out 6x, right? So then you write each factor, we have to get equal to zero. Here, when I divide by six, I just get zero, right? And then here, when I minus two, I get negative two. So these are possible points of inflection, but it could be that there's no change, right? On either side of zero, or it could be that there's no change on either side of negative two. I don't know for sure if there's a change yet. I have to do that number line part. So I'm going to put two marks for my two critical numbers. Which one goes on the left? They have to go here. Which one's going to go on the left? The negative two and then the zero. So we have three regions and we need to see if it's changing around with these numbers. So let's pick a number on this side. What number should we pick? Negative three is good. What about in between? Negative one and what about over here? One, sounds good. Remember to plug them in your second derivative. So when I plug negative three into there, negative three squared x, and then six x squared plus 12 x, I get 90. Oh no, I didn't plug in negative three. I plugged in positive three. I get 18, sorry. Then when I plug in one, negative one, I get negative six. And then when I plug in positive one, I get positive 18. So all I did on my calculator was the programming situation, right? First, I programmed the calculator x to be negative three. Then I put in the expression and it plugged it in. Then I changed the x to negative one, plugged it in, and I got negative six. Then I changed the expression for x equal to one and plug that in. Is the sign changing around negative two? It does, right? It was from positive 18 to a negative six. So negative two is an inflection point. We don't know what the point is yet until we figure out the y value. But what about zero? Is it changing around zero too? Mm. So we have two points of inflection. And if we want to know what the y values are, we have to plug negative two and zero into what? Mm -hmm. So let's see, we know we need to figure out f of negative two. Gosh, let me see. Uh, negative two stores x. I don't want to have to type that in there twice. So I'm just going to type it in once x to the fourth get down plus 2x to the third get down and hit enter so i get negative eight and then f of zero well that would just be zero right so my inflection points are negative two for x and negative eight for y and then zero for x and zero Hopefully that's in here somewhere. Oh yes, it is number letter D.
So most of the derivatives have been not so complicated. But the next, I knew they were going to ask you some crazy ones. They had to. And that's the whole point of this class is to let people take derivatives of anything. Um, so course number 13 is starting to get a little complex. Okay, so number 13 is this. Be careful, I tried to write it better on paper than it was in the computer, but that eight is an exponent of X, but eight is not an index of the radical, okay? So it's X to the eighth times this regular square root, okay? And it wants us to just find the derivative. But first, I need to rewrite this, right? What power would it be? One half, you got it. And then what would be the first type of rule that I have to apply to get the first derivative? I heard somebody say it. Yes, product rule. So that means the first factor, so I'm gonna treat this guy as the first and this one as the second. So the first factor times the derivative of the second factor. I'm gonna use a big bracket. So I have to bring down my power. You do not change your base. But then I have to decrease the power by one. What's one half take away one? Negative one half. And because the base is not just X, I have to apply the chain rule there too. What's the derivative of five minus three X? Negative three. So that's the first term times this giant derivative of the second factor. Then I can write plus the second factor as is times the derivative of the first factor. And it's just a monomial, so I don't need a big bracket. But that would be 8x to the 7. Now, what do the answers look like? Because I don't think they look anything like this. So notice how they're all one giant fraction, right? So we're gonna have to try to get ours to look like one giant fraction. I definitely have some simplifying to do here, so let's see. Um, let me just figure out what's in this bracket. That would be like negative three over two. And then this, since it has a negative exponent, it can be written in the denominator as a positive one half. And what are one half powers? They're just square roots. So this is two times the square root of five minus three X. And then this is eight X times the square root of five minus three X. So how can I get these to be one fraction? Oh, I forgot my x to the power of seven. What could I do to make them have a common denominator? This is the only denominator there, right? So we're gonna multiply by that. We're gonna do two, but you can't just multiply this all by itself, right? It has to be equivalent to the original expression. So if we do it over itself, it's like we're multiplying by a really weird one, right? Which does not change the value of the original expression. So we do get that denominator like we wanted. So they are the same. And then the monomials in the front can get multiplied together, giving me 16 X to the seventh. And what happens when you have a house times a house?
right. You end up with a house squared, which just gets rid of the house. So you just end up with five minus three. Anytime you have the house times the house, and it's the same thing inside, it will just knock out the house. We're almost there. We just need to put it over one giant denominator. And then I'm going to go ahead and distribute this positive 16x to the seventh to both of these guys. One times five is 80 minus. 16 times 3, which is 48, yep. But x to the 7 times x will give me x to the 8. So I get negative 51 x to the 8 plus 80 x to the 7 over this denominator. I don't think that the answers look like that exactly. So I need to go see what they look like so I can know what they're going to want me to factor out. It looks like all of them have x to the seventh factored out, right? So if I factor out an x to the seventh, I'm going to have negative 51 times the extra x and then just 80. Is that equivalent to any of the answers in Canvas? Come on. There it goes. E, yes, it's E, right? Don't they have a positive 80 on my paper and a negative on it? Right? So it's got to be E. Okay, so this one says find, oh my God, there it goes. I'm just gonna try to keep them both up here so we can see the answers. So it says find dy dx, but this thing doesn't have y equals, right? So it's not gonna be easy to find dy dx. There was a whole strategy on this. Um, dy dx, it just depends on how you want to do the notation. Some people choose to use dy dx and other people choose to do y prime. It's the same thing, okay? dy dx is y prime. So you have to take the derivative what's called explicitly, which means if you're taking the derivative of a variable with respect to a different variable, you have to add the prime as a factor, okay? So when I take the derivative of x with respect to x, I don't need an x prime because the variables match, right? So the derivative of x is just one. But when I go to try to take the derivative of y with respect to x, that's why we have to have a y prime because you're doing y, but with respect to x, different variables, okay? So this would be like normal, 3y squared. But because I'm differentiating with respect to x, I have to tag on the y prime. And I'm going to put it in blue just because it's a prime, not a 1. Okay. Then the same with the next term. It would be minus 12y. But again, I have to tag on the y prime. And then what's derivative of any constant? zero. And if I want to know what dy dx is, remember that's the same as y prime. I have to solve for y prime. I want to get y prime all by itself. So the first thing you want to do is factor it out of this right-hand side. 
So both of those guys were multiplied by y prime, weren't they? So we just factored out the y prime. I happen to factor it out on the right-hand side. I could have put y prime in front of the parentheses. It really makes no difference. And then how do I get the y prime completely by itself? Mm -hmm. so I'm going to divide by that big bubble on both sides. It'll cancel on the right side, leaving me with the y prime. But I have that fraction on the left-hand side. And it did say find dy dx at this specific point, 3, 1. So if I'm talking about the point 3, 1, this is the x value, and that's the y value, right? So we're just going to plug them in. 3 times 1 squared minus 12 times 1. There happens to be no x's in here, so I don't need to plug in any the 3. What do we get? 1 over negative 9? which is just negative one nine. Um, that is in there, number C or letter C. Another one, but that was a lot more complicated. Oh, that one looks fun. Oh my goodness. We'll do this one and then I'll stop. Because I don't, I don't know. I have 20 minutes. I might be able to finish. Yeah, maybe. Oh, well, we'll just go. Um, otherwise, we're gonna meet next class. I'm we're gonna I'm gonna be here next class period regardless. But we'll probably only be covering like <laughs> four or five problems, and that's it. And then you can use the rest of the class period for whatever. Okay, let me go to number 15. So this one's a little bit more complicated. Um, and the reason why it's more complicated is because you're multiplying x's and y's together. And any time that you're multiplying x's and y's together, you have to use product rule, okay? You do not have a choice. Um, so we're gonna have to do product rule twice because I have x, y on the left-hand side, but then I have x squared, y squared on the right-hand side, right? So I'm gonna have two product rules in here. So let's start at it. So the first factor, which is x, times the derivative of the second factor, which is one, but since I'm doing the derivative with respect to x, I also have a y prime. So that's the first times the derivative of the second, plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor. This is all the product rule just for the x, y. The derivative of this x is one. The derivative of this y is one but then we have to tag on the y prime. And now I can go do product rule on the other side. So first factor times the derivative of the second factor, which is 2y, but we have to tag on a y prime, plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor, which is just 2x. There's no x prime in implicit differentiation. Okay, only the y primes. Every time you take a derivative of something with y, put a y prime. It 
this is really messy, so I'm going to clean it up first, and then we'll dissect it and see what we have. So this is x, y prime. This is y. This is 1. This is y prime. This is 2x squared y, y prime. Not the same thing. 2x, y squared. And I'm going to put the little blue on there because I don't want you to think that it's an exponent. Now in the other problem, it was nice because they all the y primes were already on one side, right? And then I could just factor it out and divide by the rest of the mess. The problem with this one is that I don't have all the y primes together on one side. So we have to take that step to make that happen first, okay? So I'm going to, since I have two primes over here and one over there, I'm going to move this prime to the other side. And then I'm also going to move the non-primes to the non-prime side, okay? So this is going to be x, y prime plus y prime. And when I move that over, it's going to become negative 2x squared y, y prime. Over here, I had positive 2xy squared. And I'm going to move these two guys over, but it'll turn to minus y and minus 1. Everybody catch that step? And then now we do the same as before, right? We factor out that y prime. It doesn't matter if you put it in the front or in the back. But it's gone now, so this is just x. This is not gone just because it's y prime. What's in front of this y prime? A 1. So if there were three terms here, you have to have three terms in that parentheses when you factor it out. Just remember, when you distribute it, you need to get those three terms, right? And if this guy's missing, are you ever going to get this middle guy? You won't, right? We're almost there. Yeah, you know, it looks like there's some sign situation. Oh no, I think we'll be fine. So then y prime by itself will equal this over this. Is that equivalent to any of those in there? This one has the exact same numerator as me, right? And it has the same denominator. It just has that last term in the front, right? I'm going to pull the camera back up. It has the x plus 1, but it has this term in the front. Okay? But they are equivalent. Hmm. Okay, 16. We have in i equal to 1, 24. I think that says 24i. Yes, it does. Okay, this one says use the summation formulas to rewrite this expression without the summation notation. So I'm definitely going to need to use my summation formulas. And before I can do that, I need to manipulate this. So I'm going to distribute the 24i. So I'm going to get 24i squared minus 24i. And then I'm actually going to split this into two fractions. 24i squared over into the 7 minus 24i into the 7. Now I'm going to pretend that that's 24 into the 7 times i squared, or if you wanted to rewrite it. 
and then minus 24 into the seventh of just i. So you can use the formula for this and you can use the formula for that. For i squared, I think it's n, n plus one, two n plus one over six. But I might be wrong. So double check me on that. Sometimes I think I remember things correctly, but I don't. Yes and yes. Okay, yay. I don't want this in the background. There we go. So then now we just need to simplify this because it looks like it just has two fractions at the end. Gosh. Yay, algebra. <laughs> so I'm going to cancel this in with one of these, leaving me with six. And I'm going to cancel this in with one of these, leaving me with six. Um, and I'm going to reduce the six and 24 to give me four, and the two and the 24 to give me 12. So I end up with four times n plus one, two n plus one over n to the six. Here, I end up with 12 times n plus one over n to the six. So I'm gonna foil the n plus one and the two n plus one, and then eventually distribute the four. And I'm also going to eventually distribute the negative four. Okay. So first things first. That times that. That times that is n. Two n. That gives me three n. And since they both have the same denominator, I could write them over one denominator, but it looks like they separate them eventually. So I have eight n squared. 12n plus 4 minus 12n minus 12. So these guys are going to cancel. I'm going to have 8n squared minus, what is that? 8? 4 minus 12? Yes, 8. Over n to the power 6. I'm pretty sure I can know which one it is. I know it's E, but how are they getting those things, right? You just split the fraction and then reduce. So these, two of these can cancel. So I'll have N to the fourth and then nothing cancels over here. So we get exactly what they have, as you can see. Okay. Any questions about that one? I don't know it was a little bit much. Okay, let me write number 17 down. What is this? Oh, I remember this. This was interesting. There was one of these in the in the um, chapter five. We finally made our way to chapter five. Okay, so this one says, find a finite approximation to estimate the area under the graph of the given function on the stated interval as instructed. So it says the function is x squared. I'm looking at just between x equals zero and x equals four, but I wanna use what's called a left sum and using only two triangles or two, sorry, wrong word, two rectangles. So let me draw it first and then it helps to put things into perspective. I'm just very visual as well. So I usually try to do that. 
Um, so zero squared is zero, right? Two squared is four, so four, eight, 12, 16. So that would be here. And then four squared would be 16. So it looks like this parabola, right? But I'm only looking at from zero to four. So it's essentially this region here. I'm gonna color it in with my um, highlighter, okay? So it's that region there. Now it did say that I need to use two rectangles. And since I already cut it in half at two, you can literally see the two rectangles, right? But if you're unsure what the widths need to be, there is a formula. And especially if you're asked to do it with more than two rectangles, it'd be a little bit more complicated. It's B minus A over N, okay? Now B is this right-hand spot. A is the left-hand X value. And N is the number of rectangles, which are two, which means the width of my rectangle should be two units, okay? So then from zero to two is gonna be one rectangle. And then from two to four, that's two units again, right? That'll be the width of the second rectangle. Now I have to use less sum is the phrase that they use. What that means is when I draw the rectangle, the left corner has to touch the X value, okay? So you have rectangles, this side needs to touch the graph, okay? If it had asked me for right rectangles, then that side would have to touch the graph, okay? So if I'm drawing a rectangle from here to here, it's kind of really stupid, but it's okay. <laughs> We're gonna talk it out. This has to be my, my point, right? So is there really a rectangle here? No, there's not, okay? But for this section, there's my left spot. This is my rectangle, okay? That's the rectangle that I need to find the area of. The other one's not gonna have anything, right? I know the width is two, but what's the height of that? Zero, right? The height of this rectangle would be zero. What's the height of this rectangle? Four units. So if I wanna do the area, it's gonna be the area of the first rectangle plus the area of the second rectangle. Now here, the width is two units, but the height is zero. Here, the width is two units, but the height is actually four units. So really it's just eight. Okay. Two times zero and then two times four. So we get this one. That's a totally different answer that you would have got if you would have used the right hand rectangle. Because if I would have done right hand, that would have been my first rectangle. And then this would have been my second rectangle, okay? So the right sum would have been a different number completely. Okay, number 18. These are nice. It just says evaluate the indefinite integral. We just have to remember our integration rules, not derivative rules, right? So integration rule says five multiplier, and then you add one to the exponent. So if that's an invisible one, it's gonna become a two exponent, and then I have to divide by the new exponent, right? And when you take the integral of a constant, it becomes that constant times an x. But we still have to evaluate it from three to six. And that's where that fancy fundamental theorem of calculus comes in, right? So we're gonna plug in six. And then we're gonna plug in three and subtract the two values. Let's see, I get 36 divided by two is 18. 18 times five is 90 plus 24. Um, nine times five is 45 over two. So let's see, 90 plus 24 minus 45 over two 
and then minus 12. That's not any of the things on there. So let me change it to a decimal and I get 79.5. That one is on there. So it is C. So it's not too complicated. Just remember to use your integration rules and not your derivative rules, right? Now let's see this one. So it says find the area of the region bounded by the graphs. And so I personally have to draw this so that I can set up my integral. Um, some people could just look at it and know what to do already, but I think it's, well, no, I'm not gonna be able to draw that. So I know it will. I guess I can. One, two, three, four. So if I plug in zero into this, I'm just gonna get zero, right? If I plug in one, I'm gonna get one plus one, which is two. If I plug in four, what am I gonna get? Four cubed, which is 54 plus four. That's gonna be way up here, which is, I'm just gonna call it 68, okay? So it does look like, it's supposed to look curvy, but I can't draw. <laughs> and this is supposed to be like way up there. So it's supposed to look a lot more curvy like that, right? And I'm looking at just between this guy, this guy, and this guy. So here's y equals zero. Here's my big curve, okay? And then here's x equals four trying to draw this correctly, but you get the idea. So I need to find the area of this whole thing. So when you set up your integral, your values, your x values are going from what to what? What's this x value? Mm -hmm. And then to four. And then what is this? Isn't that the function, this function? Right? So I'm just going to integrate that function from zero to four. So some people could have gone from that to this, and that's okay, you don't have to draw the picture. So we do our integration rules and then plug in zero to four. Four to the fourth power is 256 divided by four. I get 64 plus eight minus zero plus zero. So I end up with 72. And that is one of the options. Okay, I am a minute over, but if you just have patience with me, <laughs> one more. And I don't even need to hold off another paper. So this one just says find the derivative. And for that one, I'm going to have to use my formula. Derivatives of inverse trig functions. So for cosine inverse, that's not the right one. I need the one with use this one. So I'm going to write the rule over here. So here's the rule on the side. If I want to take the derivative of the cosine inverse of something, all I do is find this angle's derivative and put a negative in front of it and then square the original angle, okay? So when I do that, y prime is going to look like negative. What's the derivative of this angle? 14x over the square root of 1 minus this thing squared. Okay. 
And that's literally all there is to it. I just need to make sure it matches uh, one of those. Does it match one? Mm -hmm, the second one, right? Yep. And that's it. That is the complete review.